They're your people, they're my people, they're our people. And uh, we remember them today uh, as we sit down and we remember these memories and moments together, uh, that incredible night in Atlanta. And so everyone here, any of you could come sit right where I am and do the exact same thing I'm going to do. I'm going to ask questions about the games, right? You think about the Duke game, right? Or you think about the Virginia game on the road or the final game in Cole or that Oklahoma game. Was that Gary's idea, Jimmy? No. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, and, we, and anybody could go through the tournament, right? Siena and Wisconsin. That was a good Wisconsin team. Beat them by 30. The Kentucky game was close for a while, longer than it needed to be. And then the incredible UConn game, game of the tournament. And then Kansas, best 30 minutes of basketball Maryland's probably ever played. That was a great team. And then the night the kids have done it against Indiana. Anyone could go through them. But those kids now have kids of their own. It's been 20 years. And what today I think is mostly about is an opportunity to ask you guys about what it means to have been part of a, of a forever team. And I know you guys spent a night together last night and the stories for each other aren't all stories that are meant to be shared in the room, but I hope that I, <laughs> those belong to you. But the ones you feel comfortable sharing with the room today, I would just ask you to feel free to grab the mic and chime in and share with us your memories. And Gary, I'd love for you just to share some thoughts first about this team and 20 years and what this weekend and what this day represent. Well, it's great to have everybody uh, back. Uh, <laughs> you don't get this opportunity very often, everybody has responsibilities. These guys are in their early 40s now, thinking they're really old. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's the greatest thing about coming back together is things don't change. You know, you, you, what happens in your life changes, things like that, but not the way it was as a team, they're, those things. And there, there are a lot of them, you have to be part of the team to appreciate that. And that's, that was great for me last night to hear all that stuff again, uh, just like it was 20 years ago. But here's the thing, you, you look at this team, uh, we were very talented. I mean, we had, you know, as talented a team as I ever coached uh, in the time I coached, not just in Maryland. But we had that thing that changes teams, that made teams special. We, we had that willingness, whatever our talent was, we were willing to give that to the team first. That, that talent wasn't about any player doing any more than anybody else. That talent was directed at winning games. And when you get to that level uh, with a talented team, you're going to be a tough out. Teams are going to have to play really well to beat you. And, um, you know, we, we were tough to beat that year. And, you know, we were determined. We, we were determined that we could win the NCAA tournament. We, we had, and it wasn't false confidence. A lot of times you see teams jump around and things like that, but they don't, they don't, really think they can win. Well, we thought we could win. We thought we could win every game we played that year. And uh, it was just great to be a part of that. And, you know, my assistant coaches, I had a great staff. Dave Dickerson can't be here today. Uh, they're playing uh, at South Carolina Upstate. So uh, he has that. But, you know, it, it's, it takes everything. It, it, and see, it, it takes you people. It takes, um, you know, former players players that played for lefty, everybody has to be together. And that's the future of Maryland basketball, too. We all have to be together. <laughs> now, the, the, uh, for the future, for the future of Maryland basketball, it, it can't be just hiring a new coach. It has to be all the people coming back to the games. The student body has to be as good as any student body in the country. The administration has to be supportive, just like they are at a Kansas, at a Duke, at places like that. And it, it takes a lot. It takes a lot to be champions, but our goal has to be to be champions. It can't be to be good. You know, we're good. We're a good basketball program no matter what. I know. The beauty, of the, the beauty of this man is that as competitive as he is, and everybody knew that, the, the emotions, his passion for Maryland are, are, are never hard to see. And this is something you and I spoke about the other night, Gary. When you came back here, 
when you came back to your alma mater. There are a lot of people in this room that, hell, we all love Lefty, still do, right? But the fact that, that they didn't see you as some, you know, you, did, you weren't a threat to who, his legacy, and nobody's, the next guy's not gonna be a threat. No one's knocking you out of the Hall of Fame, right? I mean, just the, the, the passion to be, to reach across whatever your allegiances were, your, the allegiance that you have is to the flag on your chest, right? Yeah, I mean, this is about, it's bigger than any one person. This is about us ha having, a, and we have a program that the school should be very proud of, that we're, we're a national power in basketball, and that's not going to change. But we have to make sure it doesn't change because there's other people that emulate what you try to do. And, and so they've, they have budgets nowadays that you didn't have 20 years ago and things like that. So we have to stay with it. You know, we, we have to do things. And it takes everybody. Like I said, it's not just having a great team. It's the fans, the student body. All those things are necessary if you want to continue to be successful. So we got, we, we got to, you know, understand that. And whatever we can do, whatever you are, whether, whatever you're a former player, fan, booster, whatever, you can be positive about the basketball program. And that's what we all have to do. And it seems obvious to me that you use whatever has been good. Scott Van Pelt, you know, he's as good of a person as you could have for the university in terms of rep representing the school in the media. And so all those people. Thank you. Thank you. You know, all, all, all the people that we have out there that, that are, are great Maryland fans, Maybe it's taking a little step forward, maybe being a little more demonstrative about what you are and what you care about. All, all those things are really important because I know these guys, they, they would love to see another national championship team to come to Maryland and we can make that happen. Thank you. Now, but these are the guys that brought a title to Maryland and it's, and, uh, I mean, it's amazing to, to remember from our perspective, but we don't know what we don't know. And when I see the, the, the mic has made its way to you, um, you, uh, man, you didn't miss during the tournament, it seemed, every shot that had to happen. When you, when you think back, we know what we remember. What, what do you remember most clearly about that run uh, and those six games in March and then April? Well, first and foremost, Scott, as you all witnessed the passion his emotion, how he felt about University of Maryland. I'm talking about Coach Williams. That's why all of us wanted to run through a brick wall for him. All right, we wanted to win for that man right there because he meant so much to our institution. He was passionate about every young man on the stage. All right, and he wanted to win, not just for himself. He wanted to win for all of us. All right, so it's easy to play for a man like this that believes in his student athletes, that helped them grow, and all of us have families of our own. That's because we learned from you, Coach. We right appreciate on. you. All right. When 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 I when I think about our run in 2002, it started the year before versus Florida State here at home at Cole. We lost that game, and um, I think we lost five out of six. We lost five out of six, and walking off that floor at Cole, we were being booed. Everybody said how bad we were. But most importantly, that man on the end did not let our confidence waver. He believed in all of us. And that very next practice, we planned against Wake Forest, the top 25 team. Uh, I thought he was going to come in and be Gary Williams. Sweat, scream, yell, <laughs> put us on the baseline. He did the total opposite. His demeanor, he was chill, he was confident, he believed in us. And we had solid practices going into that Wake Forest game. All right, we won against a very good team, and that propelled us to go to the Final Four in 2001. All right, I realized we came up short, but it was a stage that none of us been on. Coach Williams, no member, no member of the staff, any of us as student athletes. But going into 2002, Scott, we knew that we could win. We believed because when we came home in 01, we all got in the gym, we stayed in the gym, we lived in the gym, and we got each other better. And that was faith. It was meant to happen in 2002. And you said I made every shot. I don't think the basketball guards was, wasn't gonna allow me to not make those shots. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm very fortunate to have done it with all these men on the stage. 
Um, we will never be forgotten. It was so many great teams that came through the University of Maryland, so many great players and great coaches. Um, but we put together the right puzzle. Coach Williams and his staff put together the right puzzle, and we did something extremely special. And as you grow and you get older, you realize it was for everyone. It was for everyone. It wasn't just about the members that's on the stage. That national championship was everyone that poured into the University of Maryland over the years all right, and supported the University of Maryland. And we did this for all of you guys as well. So we appreciate you guys coming back. It's awesome to see so many familiar faces. And I look forward to seeing you guys again soon. Lonnie, uh, I see you got the mic in the back. And, and speaking of 20 years later, I know you, the, the, the emotions that, that like 20 years later, you're not kids now, like we talked about. You have the benefit of time to recognize. Like, I think we all can see that picture. He's laying on top of you. You got your hands over your head and how much you gave the team on the way to that title. As you think about it now, 20 years later, how, how do you see it compared to what you saw it as then? Um, that, that memory of, you know, us celebrating on the floor, um, the, the biggest thing I remember of the national championship game is the, the clock hitting zero and Juan throwing the ball into the air. And after that, it was just, I couldn't believe we made history. Um, you know, me and Juan were the two players that are actually from the, from the state of Maryland, him being from Baltimore, me being from Silver Spring. So um, we played with a lot of pride you know, every night, because um, we're the guys that got to hear everything when we go back to the barber shop, you know, when we <laughs> hang with our friends, you know. Um, and the thing about this team, um, we lost the year before to Duke in a game we should have won. I mean, everybody, you know, we can't make any excuses, but everybody saw what happened, everybody knows what happened. Um, after that game, we didn't cry. I mean, we were all upset. We didn't cry, we didn't complain. We said, we're gonna be back next year. And the reserve we had, the resilience we had, um, I mean, we even had it stitched on the back of our shorts at practice, on our practice shorts, like um, that we were going to be championship or bust. And just the determination we had, we lost that first game to um, Arizona. And after that, we just came out and we totally destroyed almost every team we played that year. We jumped out on people like never before because we were so hungry and so determined to get back on that, that championship stage because we felt like we should have won the year before. So that really fueled us the next year to come back. And the, the group of guys we had, the focus we had, the determination, um, not being a we didn't have any McDonald's All-Americans, no high-profile players. Um, and to just strive for that common goal, I mean, that just says a lot about us. You know, nobody ever tried to do more than they could. Everybody gave their own, you know, collective efforts, and that's why we were successful in 2002. The guy, good, you great. You, yeah, yeah, you, <laughs> Chris, I want to ask you. I remember my, I, I, we all remember things, you know, all politics are local, right? I remember what I thought about Wilcox during the tournament. I'm like, Maryland fans have this thing. Like, I wanted him to be great, but I wanted him to somehow remain a secret still, right? <laughs> like, could he somehow be great and then, like, the NBA scouts wouldn't get the tape or something? <laughs> You knew, you knew you were looking at a ghost because the guy was going to need to go, and, and, and he did. I just wonder, I've always wondered this, and I, in the Kansas game, they were great, right? That was a great team. Probably the best. Them and Duke were the only two teams that were ranked number one all year. Somehow Maryland wasn't until the end. <laughs> um, it's okay. But Drew Gooden was excellent. But you got his shot early in the game a couple of times. And I felt like you could feel him shrink because he knew, and it wasn't just you, it was Sleepy and it was Taj and it was Lonnie, but you got his shots a couple of times. I just wondered, do you remember that the same way I remember seeing it, that what you were doing was planting a seed in their, in their head that they're on the floor with somebody that's more than they're ready for tonight? Definitely. Uh, man, it's just crazy, man, playing with these group of guys, man, and, and what Gary, like what Juan said, what Gary brings out of you. You know, uh, before that game, he told, he showed me and Juan, I mean, me and Lonnie, a uh, video where uh, Drew Gooden and Nick Collison said they was the two best, best two big men in the in the NCAA, right? So okay. I said, okay, okay, bet. So I said, I told Lonnie, 
I'm going to tell you all the conversation I had with Lonnie. I'm going to be real with you, Raw. I told Lonnie, I said, Lonnie, we're going to bust their ass tomorrow. You know? <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Um, but all year, all year we were the underdogs, you know what I'm saying? So we all had stuff in here that we had to prove, you know what I'm saying? And for me to come and be playing with these guys and for them to have the confidence in me, man, for Juan to go to Gary and step up and say, you know, coach, man, I think that Chris and man can, can go or done leave it tonight, you know, and me get my first start, different things like that, man. That's confidence. That's me putting in the work. That's all of us working together. And for you have your starters to come and vouch for you to your coach, man, that mean a lot. So for me, no offense to Taj, but I couldn't get it back to Taj. You know what I'm saying? After I worked so hard for the minutes, I couldn't give it back to Taj. But the reason why that we were so successful, listen, the reason why we were so successful, I had to go against Taj every day. Uh -huh. Taj wanted those minutes back. Yeah. And my goal was to not give them back to him. So we work hard every day in practice. We work hard every day in practice. Even Cal, you know what I'm saying? He was he was undersized, you know what I'm saying? But he played he played hard for us every day, you know yep. what I'm saying? You know, um, but every guy on this squad, man, they mean something to me, man. This this is family, you know what I mean? Of course. And for your guys to go to bat for you and ride for you, and you know, me not being, you know, me being like the fourth option on the team, you know what I'm saying? And being able to go and play in the NBA. You know what I'm saying? I, I I'm it, but for me to go into the NBA, you know what I'm saying? It's big, man. That's, that speaks a lot about what we have, man. Sure. All these guys got me to be a, a lottery pick, you know? Without these guys, I'm nothing, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I was that guy that almost couldn't go to college, you know what I'm saying? And when I came here, I found a brotherhood. I got guys that believed in me. We champs, you know what I'm saying? That's big. Yep. Uh Hey, Scott. And the guy whose minutes you took, um, go ahead. I was just going to say, Taj has the mic, too. You go ahead, Drew, and then Taj, you got the mic, yeah, too. Go no, ahead. Just, just really quickly, I just wanted to go back. You know, you had mentioned about, um, you know, the speculation about Chris coming back and or potentially going pro. It's a pretty funny story. So, um, you know, after we won the national championship and we're back on the bus and we're pulling up into the back of Cole Fieldhouse, um, there were a couple of Escalades that we had never seen before sitting in the back. And one, and one, was, one had like the new 22s on it and everybody got out the bus and Chris all of a sudden got into an Escalade and I was like, well, I guess he ain't coming back no more. <laughs> so, there's that. Uh, that's, that's accurate, yeah? Yeah, it was. <laughs> okay. I felt like, you know, I felt like I had accomplished my goal here in Maryland. You know, my goal was to make it to the NBA. You know what I'm yeah. saying? I, hey, <laughs> what's the lie? Hey, we're, we're all going to go pro in something. And, and I don't know how many architect ma majors are going to make the kind of dough you get in the lottery. It's time to go, man, right? I, I, couldn't, get into the, uh, I couldn't get into that school. So the engineering uh, school me? didn't want to accept me. So I just, you know, I, I leave her. Understood. <laughs> Now, Taj, you got the mic, and I saw you grab that microphone when he yeah. started talking about getting uh, your minutes. Go ahead. So, I, yeah, I just wanted to clarify a little bit the situation with this. <laughs> so, but it, uh, you know, not to pat myself on the back, but I think it tell, it, this story will tell you uh, about everybody on this team. So, at one point, they had come to me and said, hey, we're thinking about starting Chris, and I played the good team, man. It's like, okay, coach, that's great. Like, but in the back of my head, I'm like, damn, it's about time. Because he had been... <laughs> He had been kicking my ass for like a week solid. And, you know, so I was, I was happy to see him get the opportunity. But when Chris came in, you know, he was raw athlete, just run and jump and didn't necessarily understand what we were doing. But to see the transition from where he got, when he got here to, to that time where they came to me and said he should start, I said he absolutely should, right? I didn't tell them that because I was a competitor and I wanted those minutes. But, you know, I found, that, found a way to get my minutes on the court anyway, so. Yeah. Byron, you can get by, get by. I always, through the years, there have been transfers that have come in, and, and whether they're in a short period of time, you can make a significant impact, and you did, and you were part of this forever team. And I just wonder, coming from someplace else and seeing what Gary, this coaching staff, and this team had, what sort of, how did you view your role in trying to fit in and then be something that they needed you to be? Because in the end, that's exactly what you were—a difference maker in so many different ways. Well, uh, long story short, uh, I was at the University of Tulane for two years. Uh, 
Okay, we got some Tulane New alumni. Orleans in the building. <laughs> Two. <laughs> well, for those who don't know, it's in uh, New Orleans, Louisiana, which is where I'm from. So um, out of high school, actually, Kentucky recruited him out of high school. And uh, Rick Bettino was the coach at the time. He ended up leaving, and uh, I was very disappointed by him leaving and decided to stay close to home. Uh, Tubby Smith decided to recruit me, but I didn't like him as a coach. I don't know why I didn't like him. So ended up going to Tulane. Crazy story that the first year at Tulane, Kentucky won the national championship. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, wow. I'm at Tulane, we 16 and 12 or 16 and 13. Kentucky won the national championship. Sophomore year, UConn recruit me. Sophomore year, UConn's win the national championship. <laughs> We 16 and 14. <laughs> I'm like, nah, man. All my life I've been, you know, high school, we probably, four years I played varsity basketball, we, won, we, won, we lost three games. AU national championships. Uh, then I go to Tulane, we're an average ball team. And uh, Dave Dickerson, uh, which is not here today, he actually found me in Texas playing in this little, small little gym, asked me to go to Maryland. I'm like, no way, man. It snows all the time in Maryland. I'm not going to Maryland. <laughs> no way. So, long story short, second year, I was just tired of being an average, being part of an average ball team. Uh, so, I decided to transfer. Uh, Dave Dickens started calling me, and, uh, you know, I come to the University of Maryland, and I met Jimmy Passo, Coach Gary Williams, Troy Renright, uh, Billy Hines, and, uh, you know, they convinced me that this is a place, Juan Dixon, I heard of uh, Steve Francis, but uh, the biggest thing that Coach Gary Williams told me that this team didn't have no quote unquote personality. So <laughs> I, said, I said, okay, I can change that. <laughs> I can change that. So the first day of practice, my man Kevin McCall, first day of practice, I just dive in the locker room. I dive in the locker room and I just start barking at everybody. Just start barking. And then uh, it's like, what's wrong with this guy, man? You know, he's crazy or something. And uh, you know, it was the best situation in my life, man. And uh, I have no regrets at all, because I'm living a great life. I appreciate my, my players, Coach Gary Williams, coaching staff, but uh, those two years, well, three years, I set out one year. Those three years, probably the best three years of my life uh, with these brothers, uh, Coach Gary Williams and his staff, Jimmy Passos, Matt Cavore, uh, Billy Hines, and uh, Dave Dickens is not here, man. And uh, being able to come to Maryland and help and contribute to winning this national championship. Uh, but like I say, I was a player that I never wanted to be on the bench. So like I said, at Tulane, I was averaging 16, 17 points a game, and I wanted to do whatever it took to be on the floor right. when it matters. So I made a lot of sacrifice because just like Coach said, man, there's a lot of guys that can play on this team. Nobody bickered about anything, man. We just played hard. Practices was so intense, was way harder than the games. Games was super easy. But the <laughs> practice with these guys, oh my God. Yeah. We had to bring it every day, man. And that's probably why we were so great because practice, when practice are harder than the games, it's, it's no place that you ever want to be, I mean, not, don't, no place that you don't want to be a part of. And uh, like I said, these guys, man, mold me to the person I am today. I love you guys, man, and I appreciate you guys. Thank you. <laughs> now, give that to Calvin. Calvin. I sh Calvin was shaking his head. When, when, when you have a group and the, and the roles are kind of, you know, you, you, roles are understood and guys' personalities, this guy's this, this guy's that. When a new guy comes in and he just does that and dives into the room headlong like that, it could go one of two ways, right? I mean, it could go the wrong way. What, what allowed it to work out so that everybody just didn't decide that this crazy dude from Tulane needed to get the hell out of town? <laughs> well, well, what allowed it to work was everyone had their own personality and sure. we were all accepting of everyone. Um, as long as you were coming to work, as long as you were coming to work hard, we didn't care how crazy you were, if you could help, right? <laughs> So that's why I work. I was much like Byron, you know, um, kind of crazy. I think the guys will say, you know, I, I have my quirkiness and things that I would do that you guys probably don't need to know about. But, you know, we, we brought it every day, right? We, we especially that year that Byron uh, redshirted. Our job, like Byron said last night, was to make coach as mad as possible 
because we were giving the first team a hard time. So, you know, that was our thing. We had a group called the Knuckleheads, and we brought it. No doubt. We did it every day. Absolutely. No yeah. Has a, I don't know if the mic has made its way to Steve. Steve, there's, a, I, there's so many different moments that, I, that a lot of folks think of maybe when it comes to that year. I know the Billy Packer line, oh, he, he steal, uh, where you took it from Jason. He was Jason then, he's Jay now. And I, now, here's the thing you should know. I, I get the lens people view Duke through, but you should know that he, Jay Williams has told me, he said, look, when I was at Duke, Duke Carolina was nothing. It was Duke and Maryland that was the rivalry because that's who we viewed as the team. Because from Coach K to every guy on his team, the, the thing about Duke is they punch a lot of people and a lot of people take a step back. But because of this dude, when they punched you, you took a step forward and swung right back on him. And that's why those games were so memorable and so legendary. I just wonder, in that moment, that game, what it represented, did it mean as much to you guys as it did to everybody else that wanted to see so badly you take them down? Of course, I mean, this, <laughs> I mean, we very much dislike Duke. <laughs> I'll just say that, yeah. But we had, we had a group of guys who were, we were, we were fighters. I mean, coach set the tone in that respect. Um, but we were all kind of in that same mold where we weren't going to take anything from anybody. If you hit us, we hit you back. I mean, we fought each other at times, and we, but we get back up and we become brothers again, and we hug and we move on um, because we were all super competitive. Um, and they, they bring up a lot of good points. It's like we actually are as good as we are because of how much we pushed each other. I mean, it's no, nothing bigger than that, even the guys before us. I mean. Uh, when LeBron played with LeBron Proffitt and Terrell Stokes and those guys come back and play with us in the summer and stuff, you, you become better. Um, and the thing is we complimented each other. Unlike any other team, our compliments as players was better than anybody. You know, I love to pass, he loved to shoot. One, <laughs> Lonnie was a bruiser, Chris liked to jump high. I mean, like, and we had, we had an answer for everything. I mean, guys coming off the bench, stepping up when the starters weren't playing well. I mean, so we complimented each other well on the court, and it just, as you can see, it shows we complimented each other well off the court, too. I mean, we were always laughing. We always had fun. Um, and, but, we, but we knew when to turn it on, and that's what we are so good at. So thank you for all for being here. I appreciate you. Thank you. Matt Kavar, you got the mic. Coach Kavar, you are. Uh... When a team is as good as, they, as this team was for two years solid, uh, what, what's the most important thing to keep a group connected at, and, and believing that, that the, because really winning six games in March is an incredibly difficult thing to do. That's what I think people don't get, man. There's great teams that just don't win it because six in a row is really hard to do. You guys won four the year before and could have been that year, but it was the next. But the, the ability to keep a group connected, all the different personalities, the guys want minutes, like there's a lot that's to it. How, what, how did you guys stay together and believe in ultimately you could do what you did? It, it's funny that you asked that question because that's exactly where I was about to go with, with what I w wanted to say. Uh, while it's true what everybody has said, and it was a very special year, best year Maryland basketball has ever had, make no mistake, it was not easy. It, it was not, it's not easy to win a national championship. It was years in the making. Prior players put in a lot of effort. Gary got the fans, the administration, the players, all to buy in. That was years in the making. And just because you have arguably the most talented team in the country, to your point, Scott, that doesn't mean you win the national championship. Mm. We started the year with Taj. I mean, a lot of the things that these guys have said, we just kind of, they, they were big deals. Taj Holden giving up his starting position to Chris Wilcox, that's a big deal. Taj wanted to play. You know, but for the team, he sacrificed. Byron Mouton was a scorer, 1,000 point, 2,000 point scorer before he got here. Sacrificed to be our defensive stopper. Not an easy thing for somebody to do. How many teams would love to have Sleepy Randall to give him 25 minutes? I mean, you could have, they could have been starter for a ton of teams in the league, for yes. sure. Yes, Juan, Juan wanted to be a leader. He was our leader, but he wanted to become a better leader. He struggled through that for parts of the year. And, he, and eventually he became a phenomenal leader. 
Steve Blake was the best point guard I think that's ever played here. But the guy sitting to my left was the point guard here, and he was our coach. And sometimes those two positions, you know, the head coach that used to be a point guard and the current point guard, you know, they, they can be rocky at times. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, we have Drew Nicholas, one of the best shooters in the country, coming off the bench. He wanted more minutes. So it's, it's not, it was not an easy thing to do. But when you have the leadership of a Hall of Fame coach and you combine that with talented, very talented players that are all willing to do what's necessary for the sake of the team, Coach Williams always told us, don't worry about your individual accomplishments win as a team, and all the individual accolades will come to you. And this team had the talent and believed in that, and I think that's why we won the national championship. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> Drew, you hit, you hit a, an all-time shot against Wilmington, uh, which was a year later, and that's a, a, one of those one shining moments moments. I still don't know what you were so pissed off about, Gary, after the basketball. What, like, the basket went in. What were you mad at? Like, well, you don't have the mic. You can tell me later. Um, <laughs> but that's like one of those singular moments. What do you ask more about when, when people talk to, about Maryland basketball? They ask you about that shot, or they ask you about being part of this, this team that won a title? It's, honestly, it's probably 1A and 1B, um, just because, you know, the shot was great. It was the year after. Yeah. Winning the national championship and for guys like me, Steve, Taj, Cal, we didn't want to be the team remembered to go out in the first round after winning a national championship. Like it just wasn't going to happen. But, um, you know, going back to to this team, importantly, like a lot of the things said are a thousand percent true. Everybody sacrificed you know, whether it was the starters or, or the guys coming off the bench, like people forget, like Calvin McCall was the ACC Rookie of the Year in football yeah. and decided to come and join us to basically be, you know, on the second unit, helping the guys get ready, you know, that played a, the majority of the minutes. Like we see like guys like Andre Collins, like after he left, he, ended, he ends up leading the league, in, leading the country in scoring. So like, I mean, everybody contributed in their own special way. For me, like, when I was coming in, it's a, it's a funny story. I remember right after I had committed, um, because it didn't take much for Coach Williams to get me to come. He basically offered me a scholarship. I was like, all right, I'm coming. Um, and then I remember me and Steve, we come on our official visit, because I didn't need to see the campus in order for me to come, just because I wanted to come that bad. And we come to Midnight Madness, and I'm watching Steve Francis take off from the dotted line doing windmills, and I'm like, oh shit, I might have picked the wrong place. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, little did I know, and I always knew this, like when I committed, I said, you know, my final two choices were Maryland and Hofstra. And Jay Wright was at Hofstra at the time. That was, they grew up, I grew up five minutes from Hofstra, but I said, I knew that I would be a better player after four years at Maryland because of the guys that I would be with. Now, I didn't know that I was going to be playing behind two Hall of Fame guys, <laughs> and maybe my opportunity was going to come sooner, but those two guys were the ones that made me the player that I became. Odd. Last bucket in Cole Fieldhouse. The man to your right. Could you hand the mic to Andre Collins, who hit the last, the last bucket? Now, a lot of times at the at the end of a game, maybe you just maybe you dribble it out. There were like six seconds. So you're like, I'm getting this shot up. Is that what happened? <laughs> I thought no, you were talking man. about me. Wait, what's going on here? <laughs> no, honestly, man, I was I, I got some bad advice because um, I was listening to my teammates. Yeah. And Gary was pissed off at me when I took that <laughs> shot. <laughs> Hold on now. After what Virginia did to you down in Charlottesville, where they started running their mouths when they were up about nine with the last four minutes, they deserved every one of those 112 points you dropped on their head. But I just, I wonder when that night ended, what, what do you, I, and I, again, when I mentioned Earl earlier in those last few minutes, that, that whole night was a celebration. Anybody on the floor, you can't be mad at the He's got to get a shot up, and it goes in. And what, what do you remember about that night and, and, and just how important it was for this team to finish that year unbeaten the last year in Cole? 
I mean, it, it just, we closed out Cole. It's, it's such a historic place. Um, you know, it was just a great moment, great memory for us. Um, you know, it was really important for us to, to go undefeated in Cole that year. It was great because so much alumni, former players, uh, you know, it was, it was an amazing th thing to do. So many people came back and, um, you know, took part in that. You know, it was so much history in that building. Uh, yeah. For me as a kid growing up in, on the Eastern Shore of Maryland, you know, in high school, our number one goal is always to get to Cole Fieldhouse. Um, so to, to be able to, to do that in high school and then come here and actually win the last game here and what well, we went 16 and 0. Yep. 16 and 0 in Cole. Um, you know, that's just a, uh, an amazing experience and it was just great to be able to, to send that building off the way that we did. Uh, Mike, I'm going to get to you in one second. Juan, I just have one question about that Virginia game because I, when I was, I was thinking about today and that, and that season, I had forgotten what went on down there. They had a, they had a lead, and it got, uh, story goes that maybe some stuff was said, maybe they were thinking they were going to get a victory, and then they did not. Um, I believe you led the way that night with 21. What, what, what do you remember about that night and, and sort of what that game said about your guys' competitiveness and togetherness to come back against a, a t they were a top 10 team at the At time. UVA? At UVA. Well, I remember prior to the tip, do y'all remember how disrespectful they were towards me? Right? So. Down at UVA, students were right on the floor. At this the old U-Hall. That was back when they were in U-Hall. Yes, at the old, old building. And they were so uh, disrespectful towards my upbringing right. and everything that I endured as a young kid. And I was ready to fight them, <laughs> right? I, and, and my guys, all my guys had my back. But going into that game, that was a, that was a very good UVA team. They were well coached. They had a couple of NBA players on that team and they played well together. Um, and we got down, but we stuck with it. You know, Coach Williams, like I said, I always talk about how much he believed in us. He believed that we could win that game. And everybody, everybody made plays down the stretch, um, but winning at UVA uh, is always a tough out. There was our rivals once, when we were in the ACC, and, and um, we wanted to win every game against those guys. But I just remember how disrespectful, the thing that stuck out the most, how disrespectful they were. Mm -hmm. And we were able to come away with the big win. And so when they, and so when they came back here for senior night in the yeah, final we didn't night forget that goal, shit. Nah. They, they were going to get what they got. No, nah, we didn't forget that. We didn't forget it. And, and I think we scored it with 112. 112. Three was 112. Thanks to his three. Right. <laughs> Thanks to his three. I think we ended up beating them by 20 plus. It's like 112 to 90, something like that. And we didn't forget. We wanted to punish them. And that's exactly what we did. Yes, you did. <laughs> Mike, like, uh, like Drew, there's moments that you're remembered for post-title, obviously some free throws against Duke in the ACC title that are, the, that are always be memorable, very clutch. But I just, I wonder your association with this team as you go through your life and you're, you get to wear 2002 title and you get to wear that M on your chest, what, what that has represented in your life to you? It, first off, it's so great to be back. It's awesome to see everybody. and. Uh... <laughs> and Drew and I were talking last night about some of the you know, trips. I'm from Long Island. Drew and I grew up a few towns away from each other. And uh, after they lost Oklahoma going back to, for Christmas, and Coach always had a rule, you had to be back two days before a game. And talking about the sacrifices, here we are driving back to College Park Christmas morning to get back to practice Christmas night. Um, there's, there's so many stories behind the scenes of just the sacrifice that not just the players, but obviously so many that supported us went through. Um, my perspective is kind of unique as a freshman being on that team and seeing the connections that these guys had. It was, it was kind of surreal to like just be part of it. And, uh, you know, we had in the, in the preseason, our, you guys remember the workout shirts and it said Atlanta, uh, you know, their cut t-shirts, Atlanta Final Four, uh, 2002. That was in the preseason. So our workout shirts had Atlanta on them. And that's what I came into in that, in that summertime. It was incredible. Our, the, uh, Midnight Madness with Coach declaring they're going to win the championship. You know, who does that? Like, he literally said we're going to win the championship in the preseason. You know, to be a part of that was just so special. Not that all, all the programs and all the teams that we had here at Maryland I was a part of were special in their own way, but this team was just so unique about how they came together. And it's, it's a brotherhood. And, it's, and it, does, it, it shouldn't surprise anybody to see how well they're all doing for themselves now, not just in, in their careers, but their families. Uh, it's just a, a real, real special group, and I'm glad to be part of it. Hey, Jimmy, I'll get to you in one second. 
Leslie, if I could get to you as well, I just, the same, the same kind of thing as Byron, you come into a group and, and it's, I ask the same thing that I asked Mike, just as you guys were together last night and the stories are shared and the emotions are, you know, that belong just to you guys, what's it like to be in a room like that 20 years later and remember what you guys did? Well, let me put it like this. I come from a junior college, Allegheny, where Steve Francis was. At first, no disrespect, fellas. I wanted to go to Syracuse. <laughs> I ain't gonna even lie to you. That was my team ever since high school. I wanted to go to Syracuse, but Merlin, uh, Jim Passos, and uh, Dave Dickerson came down. It was like, yeah, you can go to Maryland. I seen it on the Final Four, and then my head coach there at the junior college was like, what can you do for Maryland? They already got Lonnie Baxter, Chris Wilcox. I like, I can be the fourth man. <laughs> You know, I can help out, I can do what I gotta do to get them ready to play. I've been there before. I've been on the second squad to get my first team to go. Came to Maryland, uh, Jimmy Passos and Dave Dickerson, they was uh, in the office and they was like, you know you playing behind Lonnie. I said, yeah, I know. You probably, probably get two or five minutes <laughs> of playing time. And I told them, I'm going to go hard before my two or five minutes because I knew Lonnie was going to come in because, you know, he didn't want to sit down anyway. So uh, playing, playing with these guys, I had to do what I had to do to help him. You know, if he only wanted two minutes, coach put him back in. I sit down, cheer him on. Hey, come on, man, you got to pick back up. You know what I'm saying? It was many late nights. We was in the hotel talking, and he'd tell me what i do wrong. Blake would say, catch the ball my first year, you know. And I'll be like, yo, I'm catching the ball, but you know, I gotta get used to this ball. I've been playing junior college, you know. Let me get some time. Give me some time. But uh, playing with these guys is great, you know. Uh, we had lots of fun. Like Mouton said, the practices, whoo, <laughs> man. The practices was, was good. I remember one time uh, Chris came down the middle and tried to dunk, well, he dunked it. Jimmy Passos at told me, why you didn't try to block it? For what? <laughs> why I'ma block his why I'ma block his dunk? Do you see how high this man jumped? You see him on TV. <laughs> his chest is over the rim. No. I'm not jumping. Nope, nope, nope. That's tremendous. <laughs> now. All right, so this is by design. I'm, I'm not the smartest guy in this room. I think that's understood, but I had to wait until about now to let Jimmy Patsos get on the mic because this is, this is the best storyteller I know. Uh, and I, I would be remiss if I obviously didn't give you an opportunity, Jimmy, just to share what, what this group means because your passion for Maryland basketball is so understood. What you meant to Gary, what you meant to this group is so well understood. I just want to know, as you sit here with this team and these folks, what just what's just sort of on your mind and in your heart? You know, people don't know this about Gary Williams, but we actually had a lot more fun than you guys thought we did. <laughs> we loved winning. We loved competing. It was fun going to work. I remember talking to Matt Kavork. He was going to law school. I'm like, what? You do that later. We got stuff going on here every day that's exciting. Roller coaster with this group, but it was so exciting coming to work, coming to Maryland, watching the school change. Becoming like Kansas and them. I work with Drew Gooden and Karan Butler. I'm lucky to be in the media. Well, maybe, but whatever. Um, no, I'm in the, I work some NBA stuff with them. And I had lunch with Karan Butler and Drew Gooden, and they both said we were so mad when the bracket came out because we were on their side. You guys were deep. You were talented. You had that coach of yours. They knew. And, and, and those were the two best games of the tournament. Yep. And Karan Butler said they were going to win. Remember, I'm going to give this back to Gary. Jim Calhoun said, whoever wins this game is winning it all. Then Roy Williams said it the next night. So that's kind of a, where we came from to be a national power, to walk around the country, to say we'll play anybody. We'll play anybody, anywhere, anytime. I including Oklahoma, because I was out of the office with Troy that damn day, and I came back and said, who scheduled Oklahoma? <laughs> Gary had answered the phone. TV, CBS, Oklahoma, we're there, because that's where, who we were, because we had earned that. And uh, then we went to Bentley's and celebrated, win or lose, but you, <laughs> mostly winning. But my point is, sorry to get emotional. We just carried this chip around the United States, that we were Maryland basketball, that was our guy, 
and we'll see you in the Final Four. We did it back to back, then we beat their ass, and we should have won the next year, but we went to the Sweet 16, and we didn't care who we played or who we recruited against. We'll take you on. Oh. Gary, I just, why was, it, why was it always Jimmy's fault on the bench? Because it was. <laughs> no, Jim, Jimmy, Jimmy was unbelievable because he put up with my stuff all those years, 13 or 14? 13. Just 13. And, um, but what it, what it was, it was a release for me, and at least during that time, I wasn't yelling at the officials, so that probably helped us as a team. But Jimmy was one of those special people as an assistant coach that could do everything that I didn't like to do. He was really good with people. <laughs> <laughs> no offense, no offense. No, no, no offense to anybody. But uh, summer camp, Jimmy loved talking to the parents when they brought their little kid to campus. And because he didn't make it to the NBA the next year, you know, the parents were mad at me. And Jimmy could always talk to those parents. So uh, that was always good. But what, what Jimmy did, uh, the, the players, like assistant coaches, I was an assistant coach for uh, seven years in college. And the thing I found out was the great assistant coaches, the players feel like the assistant is on their side whenever they have problems, say, with the head coach. And the head coach feels that the assistant coach is extremely loyal to him. And Jimmy was able to do that. And a lot of assistant coaches can't do that. They're not good enough to do that. Jimmy. Patsos was as great as an assistant coach as there's been in college basketball, and I'm very honest about that. And the, the, other, the other thing is, um, Jimmy went to Catholic U. He's a good player at Catholic U. He went to Catholic U because he couldn't get into Maryland. Uh, you know, it's like Dr. Pines, you know how that, you know. But, and, and, um, but he, he was Maryland. You know, there, there was never a doubt about Jimmy where sometimes you see some of these assistant coaches, you're not sure, you know, are they working for the school, are they working for themselves, somebody else, whatever. So I was really lucky to have Dave Dickerson, Matt Cavour, Jimmy Patsos as my staff because they'd go to war for me. They, they'd fight, you know, there, there was no doubt about it. And, you know, to have that feeling when all I had to do was basically concentrate on the basketball and coach the basketball team. That meant a great deal to me, so thanks you guys, and thanks to Dave Dickerson for what they did. Ah, uh, you're not done. I, I, don't think, I don't think you're done, Coach. I'm gonna, I, I need you to, uh, as, as our time is winding down here, the team's gonna need to get over uh, when we finish up here to, to see our our current team, we got a game coming up here top of the hour, and I know that uh, the fellas want to go see, see the team before they get going, but um, by, by way of wrapping up, Gary, I know your family's here. I know how much they mean to you. This is your basketball family here. Uh, when you get together last night and you sit around over a steak and some wine and you laugh and you, you share the stories, and as Steve told me, when these guys get together, they don't talk about basketball. They talk about their lives, what they're doing. Wants kids who, by the way, well, I don't know what year they are, but they better like we, they better be coming here, right? <laughs> um, when you're with them and you see who they've become, uh, and you think of what you did together, what what are you most proud of of what this 2002 team did beyond hanging the banner that means so much to our university? Well, you heard them here today. What they're like as adults now uh, in their communities where they live, but the thing was they had that maturity at a very young age when they were playing, and, and yet they were still young people. They still enjoyed themselves. And in fact, I found out something uh, last night. I thought I knew everything about your team. You, as a coach, you know, you think, well, I know everything that's going on with the team. At the end of practice, we would eat sometimes at Sir Walter Raleigh restaurant up there, up the university. They used to race cars from the behind Coalfield House to Sir Walter Raleigh to see who would get there first. <laughs> Not that they were competitive or anything like that. But I didn't know that, and, and that's probably a good thing. Uh, I didn't know. So the, the big thing with the team is that they're, they're loyal. The, the loyalty will never go away. Uh, what they did, and once, it's one thing if you have a team that's pretty good, 
they understand that, man, they, they, we, we got to stick together just to have a chance to win games. Well, these guys were different. They were very talented. And they decided to stick together to win a national championship. And that's what they did. Yes, indeed. How about it? How about it? One time, the 2002 national champion, University of Maryland basketball team. Well done, fellas. Well done. That's all good. Thank you all. Appreciate it. 2002 national champion.